The concept of thinking in terms of a distant future that we can arrive at is one that, that I find exciting and necessary. We found that if you take people out of the city, you take them out of cell phone range, you put them in a context that can start conversation, and that's really what the Clock Project is about. It's about starting different types of conversation that you would not normally have. And this place really does that. You get up into the bristlecone forest and you're looking at bristlecones that, that were probably saplings when the Great Pyramids were being built four or 5,000 years ago. It, it immediately achieves the goal that the clock is trying to achieve. And so we want to see how people react to that and see how we can capitalize on what's already the natural beauty and power of the site and how we can enhance it. And it's, it's actually pretty rare that a man-made object enhances a natural site. And we want to achieve that. The long now has always been an exercise in sort of stretching your mind and accepting responsibility for more, or at least grasping more in your, in your thinking patterns. And this is a natural place for sort of doing that spatially too, so the big here. And when you stand up on top of that mountain and you look for hundreds of miles in every direction, you really have a sense of um, how small an individual human is. And, the, on the earth, and it's pretty unspoiled stuff that you see in every direction. And so for us, it's a sense of responsibility, too, for kind of keeping that unspoiled. It's a monument to an idea. It certainly reflects a thoughtfulness that I deeply appreciate and that I'm really delighted to be able to play a small part in. There's this weird dichotomy in the sense that we really do want to build something that's going to last for 10,000 years. We really do want to leave this for the future. But that's not really why we're doing it. We're really doing it so that people today to get them to think, to get them to expand their time horizons so that they can think not just about this quarter, this fiscal year, this presidential election, but to get them to think about these long-term problems. I think the conversation that took place out in the desert it was the continuation of one that's been going for a while and that is going to be carrying on for a long time yet. And, uh, and yes, I was part of it, but so was everyone else who attended. And so is everyone else who comes to Long Now events and who becomes a member and who watches the videos or listens to the podcasts or engages with these ideas at any level. Because it is finally not about the origins of those ideas, but about you know, what we do with them. One of the most interesting aspects of, of being out there was sort of watching a community begin to congeal before your eyes. And this is a, a, a multi-part and very long-term process, obviously, but there are milestones along the way where you can say, you know, something special happened in this journey, and I, and I think last week's trip to the clock site was one of those moments. Good evening. I'm Peter Schwartz from the Long Now Foundation. It's my uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Stuart Brand. Um, Stuart's been shaped, I don't have to give you his resume, everybody here knows Stuart, uh, but Stuart's been shaping the world of culture and ideas in the Bay Area for 40 years. And for a lot of that time, I've had the privilege of having him as a friend and collaborator. 
It's all about the questions. It began with the question, why haven't we seen a picture of the whole earth yet? And in all the years we've worked together, what Stuart has done is always asked the hard questions. And tonight, he'll be asking the hard questions that he asked so well in his brilliant new book, Whole Earth Discipline. And he'll be asking the hard questions tonight that led him to rethink green and may lead you to rethink green. Stuart Brand. This talk is going to be a little uh, like firing a bullet through my book. It'll touch on a few things, miss most, and not take very long. In the book title, I know it sounds like it's Whole Earth Catalog Revisited. Some of it is, but mostly it's not, because this time the title is used literally instead of decoratively. It means the, population, the planet's whole climate and its whole population. The world population is about 6.8 billion now. And uh, of that, the, developing, the developed countries are 1.1 billion, the developing countries 5.7 billion. That means five out of six of us live in the developing world. That's the crucial fact. In the developing world, our lives are changing drastically, mostly for the better as we move into town, create jobs, and educate our kids. Our countries in the developing world are building infrastructure, and we are still learning about the critical value of natural infrastructure, forests, aquifers, biodiversity, and a predictable climate. In the developing world, we control most of the planet's land surface. We're in Africa, we're in Asia, we're in Latin America, and we are on the move toward opportunity, wherever it may be. Most of that opportunity is in the cities. That's why we're going there. It's the dominant demographic event of this century is the screamingly rapid urbanization. By mid-century, the whole world will be about 80% urban, the way the developed world is now. And that's the sequence. The developed world passed the 50% urban point back in 1950. The developing world is going to get there very shortly, and the balance of power will shift. Nearly all the action in the developing world, in the global south, and uh, when you compare it to uh, what happened in Europe and North America, the developing world is urbanizing three times faster and nine times bigger. Now, supposedly, the world's largest cities are always the drivers of history. As we see from looking at history, we now have a distri distribution of urban power similar to a thousand years ago. In other words, the rise of the West was great, but it's over. The aggregate numbers are overwhelming. Every week, 1.3 new million, uh, million new people in town. Some of them are born there. Most are moving there. Question is, what's the attraction? Action. This is Kibera, bustling squatter city outside Nairobi. Everybody's busy getting the hell out of poverty as fast as possible. Squatters are grassroots entrepreneurs. If you can't find a job, create a job. Same thing with your house, same thing with your town. Here's an equally busy lane in a deli slum. Another busy lane <clears throat> in one of Mumbai's many slums. And a busy market in uh, Rosinia, one of Rio's countless favelas. This is urban life at its densest and social capital at its richest. Everybody in a slum neighborhood knows each other well, whether they want to or not. Because what's going on is this intense mystery called the informal economy, which specializes in being visible to itself and invisible to authorities. It's huge. Economists have not yet figured out how it works or taken much account of how it feeds the formal economy of nations and feeds the world. So for example, in Mumbai, um, the economists are still catching on that slums do not undermine posterity. They help create it. Mumbai is said to be half slums. It is also one-sixth of the gross domestic product of all of India. The informal economy steals electricity from the formal economy. 
This is homemade infrastructure. Here's a dramatic slum interface in Sao Paulo. If you take a close look at that edge, you see something interesting. Cities specialize in jamming ways of life together and thereby creating value. You put supply right next to demand. Here are the cooks and the maids and the gardeners and the guards in the lively part of town on the left walk to work in the boring rich neighborhood on the right. Proximity is amazing. It's like a coral reef of humanity. Proximity empowers. Urban intensity is at its most resourceful in a working slum. A far-reaching train and a near-reaching market can brush together in a strangely intimate dance. Good luck thinking about that one, city planners. <laughs> the Dowervi slum performs no end of services for itself and for the city at large. Among other things, it has 4,000 recycling units and 30,000 rag pickers sorting 6,000 tons of rubbish every day. Now that's recycling. Basically, the greenest of all humans are slum dwellers in the developing world. They use minimal energy, material, and food, and they recycle everything. Here's one. But they are that green because they are so poor, and they do not choose to remain poor. Nor should anyone in the developed world require them to stay poor in order to stay green. They will climb the food ladder toward more protein, and they will climb the energy ladder toward more electricity. This is in uh, Darby. A gentleman named Lakshman Kumbai says, for toilet purposes, we have to go outside. It's a problem. We have to go on the road. The electricity is on for two days, then off for two days, or not on at all. We don't have much space for the children to play in. They use the road to play, and accidents take place again and again. I've not studied at all and am illiterate. For work, I stitch government jeans and pants. It's fine, but the workday ends late. I want to educate my kids until the day I die. I'll educate them. As long as I'm around, that's guaranteed. I don't want to be in the way of this gentleman. <laughs> he will make these things happen. Parents in the slums pool their money and hire teachers, often their neighbors, uh, to do private, private, tiny, unofficial schools. And that education going on in those places changes the world. They're often very good schools, sometimes better than the official ones. So the big event in the world is that for the next 30 years, you're going to have a world full of young people in new cities in the global south and the rest of us in old cities being old people in the global north. Now, where do you think the action is going to be? Now, if you want to save a village, here's what it takes. Bear the city in mind. You want a good road to town. You want a good cell phone connection. This, of course, is one of Jan Chipchase's uh, slides from Nokia. It is no accident that the developing world now dominates cell phone innovation. They did that with $10 cell phones. Imagine what they're going to do with $20 smartphones. Now, right now, they're charging those cell phone batteries with diesel fuel hauled in by truck. But if they can get electricity, grid electricity, then the village comes back to life, and it is no longer a dark trap. Because villages emptying out is the main thing that is making cities green in the developing world. The people leave the poverty trap and ecological disaster of subsistence farming behind. When they're gone, the natural environment recovers, and those who remain in the village develop cash crops on better land for the new customers in town. In the developed world, where we are, cities are green because the city dwellers use less energy and materials than people in the suburbs or countryside. So come to my book and one of its points is that cities are green. Both in the developed world and the developing world, as soon as people move into town, they immediately start having fewer children. Uh, in the developed world, it's way below, uh, actually, the replacement birth rate of 2.1, and is rapidly getting there in the developing world. 
There are four major news items in my book, I think, that people keep asking about. These are the man bites, dog story. Nuclear power is green, genetic engineering is green, and geoengineering may well be necessary because that's the other main whole earth event that's going on besides uh, this huge move to town, this, this wealth finally coming to the developing world, and that's climate change. I'm not going to do much on that. You've all seen the J curves and whatnot. But here's a little sample of how gnarly it gets. This is a quick look at why the climate news is going to keep being worse than we expect sooner than we expect. Climate is a profoundly complex nonlinear system full of one runaway positive feedbacks, hidden thresholds, and irrevocable tipping points. These are just some of the ones that we know about. Now, one that is an interesting positive feedback is um, this one. The Arctic ice melted 40 years ahead of schedule because of a positive feedback situation. Bright ice like this reflects sunlight. Um, but dark water doesn't. Is it going to give me some dark water? There is the dark water. Yeah, see? And the room lit up, and then it went dark. Uh, bright ice reflects sunlight. Dark water absorbs it. Warm water makes less ice, uh, which then makes more water, which makes less ice, and that's positive feedback. And it keeps going until there isn't any ice left. Similar dynamics are going on with tundra and methane with the rainforest drying out and going away and taking the rain, the clouds, and a million species with them. But something I constantly want to do is, is look at the next interesting thing going on. And uh, the next interesting thing to me is, while it's relatively easy to detect positive feedbacks because it's you know, the thing taking off, negative feedbacks can be mysterious. Here's one, um, and they are the good news. So it, there is this uh, unidentified sink of carbon, which is quite large. And they can see how big it is, but they don't know where it's going. These decades, a lot of carbon is disappearing from the air. We don't know where it's going. And that's, you know, the good news is it's happening. The bad news is we don't know what's happening or why it's happening, so we don't know how to help it or at least stop hindering it. Another such story is uh, the peculiarities of this wonderful algal coccolithophore named Emilia, Emiliania Huxleyi, named for Thomas Huxley, e -hux to its friends. It forms huge blooms that are visible from space. It brightens the Earth's albedo when it does that, draws down vast quantities of carbon into its hard shell, and then politely sinks to the bottom of the ocean. In the process, it emits dimethyl sulfide particles that become the nuclei for water droplets, thereby creating reflective clouds and it prospers even when the sea becomes acidic, which is what's happening these days. Now, a few weeks ago, I spoke at the State Department, and one slide, it's unreadable, but it gives you a sense of where the climate refugees are expected as the problems of climate continue to multiply over the next years and decades. Climate events are expected to lead not only to massive motions, movements of, of refugees, but what you get with that is resource wars, chaos wars, and potentially a, a massive dieback if climate keeps being catastrophic. Jim Lovelock's version of this is that if we go to the warmer world of five degrees Celsius warmer that he thinks we are now in progress toward, there's carrying capacity for maybe a billion and a half humans. We're already seeing bits and pieces of this. Darfur is a Classic case. Basically, drought is the great civilization killer. It is the great carrying capacity reducer, and it leads to people fighting over the diminished resources left. We're also seeing not only fire, but fire squared, as they say, uh, in Australia, in the American West, and lots of other places. As the trees dry out, they born, burn more easily, Get another positive feedback there, they're putting a lot of carbon into the air when they burn. One of the direst potential places is the Himalayan Plateau, because global warming is melting those glaciers, uh, such as these in Bhutan, and those glaciers feed 40 per, give water to 40% of humanity. 
Look at the major rivers there, the Indus. I mean, these are major rivers. The Indus, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Mekong, Irrawaddy, Yangtze, and the Yellow River. Talk about the developing world, that's where everybody lives. So, greenhouse gases, how do we reduce greenhouse gases? Let's get down to what it takes to make baseload electricity. A lot of it in the developing, developed world, a lot coming in the developing world. I was just with Peter Schwartz and friends in Cambodia, Singapore, and Vietnam a couple of weeks ago. And uh, you know what? Some of those people get any money at all are getting air conditioning. It's going to be Miami globally. That's a lot of energy. So the real fact is our climate problems are caused mainly by coal, which is the cheapest source of energy. Everyone will keep burning it until governments make it expensive. Cities require base load power, electricity available all the time. Wind and solar so far can't provide it. The only carbon-free substitutes for coal are nuclear and hydro, and hydro in most of the world is already maxed out. Now, I thought we might have solar beam down from space, and then I got beaten up by Elon Musk, who knows a lot about space and a lot about solar, and said, no fucking way. <laughs> uh, even if we could get the equipment to orbit for free, uh, beaming it down to rectennas on the ground and the rest of it is just too expensive and impossible, so forget it. So, sorry about space solar, which would have been nice, it'd be on 24 or 7, but we're back to hydro and nuclear. Bear in mind that the folks in the developing world want that electricity. They will either at present get it from coal or from nuclear. And while we're at it, the developed world uh, likes to leave the lights on at night. That's what we do, that's what we, how we refer to cities, bright lights. So, coal and nuclear. This is the main green argument that I see for nuclear. Compare what happens to the waste products from nuclear versus coal. Now, bear in mind the differences in pure scale here. If all the electricity you used in your lifetime came from nuclear, the waste would just fill a Coke can. Whereas a normal one gigawatt, gigawatt Coke plant burns 80 real cars of coal a day each car holding 100 tons of coal, and that turns into 19,000 tons of carbon dioxide, plus no end of slurry, fly ash, atmospheric mercury, and the rest. Where does that carbon dioxide go? Now, the nuclear waste uh, is small and contained, two casks a year for a gigawatt plant, uh, whereas the coal, eight million tons of carbon dioxide go into the atmosphere, where we can't do much about it. We don't even know what the hell it's doing there. And we, it's sure is hard to get it back. And when you compare the lifetime emissions per kilowatt hour from the various energy sources, nuclear, <clears throat> when you add it all up, compares to hydro and wind, and it's ahead of solar so far. Now, if you don't think that coal and nuclear are competitive, just ask the miners in Australia who mine for coal. They don't want nuclear. Okay, wind and solar. I remember the whole Earth catalog was wind was, was when wind was something you put on your roof. Wind now is huge infrastructure. That's great, but that's where the efficiency is, is at very high altitude, high as you can get, and uh, with as big a diameter blades you can, you're getting up to over 300, some going up to 500 feet. And by the way, the wind and, and people are usually in different places who so have very long power lines with their usual expense and loss of efficiency, uh, moving the electricity you get from wind into town. And in fact, they're always supplemented with uh, gas-fired plants because of the, uh, the wind not always blowing problem. The solar issue is one, not only that the solar isn't a massive supplier of energy yet, in fact, they say there's 10 gigawatts of solar capacity in the world. Well, since that's 14% efficient in terms of um, that is not efficient, but in terms of you know, when the sun is on and everything is working, that means you get one, at present in the world, we get 1.4 gigawatts of electricity from solar, which is less than one large nuclear plant. Then the footprint issue. Go to a pretty place in the desert and think about what it will look like when you drop uh, the solar panels for these large solar farms on them. It is basically a bulldozing process. 
And you might think that this is a uh, uh, particularly nice part of the Southern California desert, but as you can see from the Google location of the photograph, it's in the middle of nowhere, and it is exactly the kind of place that will be bulldozed for these things. Saul Griffith is in the audience, and he will recognize uh, part of what I'm doing with his talk a few weeks back. Civilization currently uses about 16 terawatts of power, most of it from combustion. Getting it to level off, getting our climate to uh, level off by getting the parts per million of carbon dioxide down to 450 over the next 25 years requires replacing 13 terawatts with new clean energy. And he says you can do it with 30,000 square miles of uh, solar panels, 15,000 square miles of mirrors. This is in 25 years. 2.6 million turbines, which take about 100,000 square miles, give or take, in good locations. 1.5 million square miles of engineered algae for the biofuels. Uh, if you've got geothermal finally going, it takes over 27,000 steam turbines. And this is, you can keep those footprints down to that point by saying, let's get the three gigawatts from nuclear and there'd be only 3,900 one gigawatt reactors. That's mitigation, that's what it takes. Add it all up and it's an area about the size of North America that uh, Saul refers to as Renewistan. <laughs> so, you know, talk about a sacrificial, sacri this is a world sacrifice here. All of North America is gonna give up it's sunlight and landscape and everything else, so everybody will have solar and wind energy. Not going to happen. Um, something that didn't make it into the book. There's a lot of stuff in the book about how radiation is not as worrisome as, as we imagined. And it's one of the reasons that Jim Lovelock is so comfortable with nuclear is because he used to be, uh, his profession originally was in medicine, and he worked with isotopes and is completely familiar with uh, how relatively manageable and undangerous radiation is. After all, we use it in the hospital all the time. But then there's this thing called radiation hormesis. And here's a little story. It's the case of the radioactive Taiwan apartment houses. So there was this uh, contaminated recycled steel that had a whole bunch of radioactive cobalt-60. Went into 180 buildings in Taiwan. 10,000 people lived there, and they were exposed to an average of 1,300 millirem a year for 20 years in succession. So their cumulative dose per person ranged from 40,000 to 600,000 millirem. Bear in mind that people at Chernobyl died when they were exposed to 400,000 millirem in an acute situation. This is chronic versus acute. They did the studies in uh, Taiwan. What's the normal cancer rate there among a similar population of 10,000 people? And uh, normally it would be, out of 10,000 people in that 20 years, 232 would die of cancer. That's the general population. Now for the 10,000 that were exposed to all this radiation, the big question is, how many of them died of cancer in that 20 years time? And I, I have welcome guesses, twice as many, 600, three times as many, 400. Uh, half, 150? 235? 110. Do I hear anything more? Zero. <laughs> that would be a miracle. Actually, that one's the closest. Seven of those people died from cancer in that 20 year period of time. In other words, they had 3% of the normal cancer rate thanks to being exposed to all that damn radiation. Here's the chart from the paper, and the paper, which is titled, Is Chronic Radiation an Effective Prophylactic Against Cancer? <laughs> it was published in 2004 in the Journal of, uh, American Journal of uh, Surgeons and whatever it is to find print to read. Something weird is going on with <laughs> radiation. And studies are finally now going forward to see, you know, is <laughs> radiation good for you? Uh, you immediately started thinking, uh, gosh, maybe this could take care of our spent fuel problem. Instead of <laughs> burying it in the ground, we'll carve it up in, in portable hunks and sell it to people to put under their bed <laughs> so they won't get cancer. The hell of it is, is that they actually work. We should have some in the lobby. <laughs> okay, the big bugbear, Chernobyl. 
uh, what was it, 46 workers died and nine children uh, from a thyroid cancer that was mainly the cause, happened because the government didn't get, it's very easily treated in children and everybody except those nine that got the thyroid cancer is now cured, the nine they didn't treat fast enough did die. You go to Chernobyl now, lots of people do, and you know, take a very dour expression and take these really scary photographs of how weird and awful it is there. And the reason they can do that is it's back to background radiation. It's like any other part of Ukraine, or here for that matter. There are a few hot spots. One of the great things about radiation is it's really easy to pick up with a dosimeter or Geiger counter or whatever, and you, oh, there it is, you put a little flag around it, and then it fades quickly. That's what radi radioactivity does. So what you've now got in the Chernobyl area is, and this is a, a great quote from one of the biologists who studied the area for 15 years, that uh, the animals came back because people stopped doing the thing which is hardest on animals, which is farm and log and live in places. And as soon as we move out, and this is a whole chapter, I think, in uh, The World Without Us, uh, the animals came back, that's a wolf. Now we have wolves generally in that part of the world. They've reintroduced some of the, the European uh, bison and so on. And Pripyat, meanwhile, it's 50,000 people moved out and it is now reforested and it looks quite beautiful. So the best thing, and this is something the United Nations recommended after visiting there, is that the area, its main problem now is not radiation, it's very economically depressed and the best thing they could have is tourists. So Chernobyl National Park would be, I think, an amazing thing to have. And once they get the big sarcophagus over the, uh, the exploded plant, it'll probably last as long as Stonehenge and be even more interesting to think about. <laughs> I'm gonna brush by the whole question of proliferation. Uh, it's well to remember that nuclear energy has dismantled more nuclear weapons than any other activity. This is a, for some reason, quiet program that buys up warheads from the Russians and turns them into nuclear power. And in fact, you can see the number of warheads that have been converted as of June. 20% of nuclear power in the US comes from, 20% of our electricity comes from nuclear. Half of that is coming from the Russian warheads, thank you. And uh, when we're finished with theirs, we're gonna start uh, using ours. There's probably no other, civil, there's no other weapons system it has as much civilian value in it when you decommission it. All right, well, how about the spent fuel? The standard thing one hears is, oh, the spent fuel is such a difficult problem that there's no place in the world where uh, we can put spent fuel. Well, uh, we were gonna put it in Yucca Mountain, but that's out, uh, like a zero budgeted uh, about a month ago. So where it is, is where it's been for quite a while now, in dry cache storage in the various reactor sites around the US and around the world. Uh, you can go there and be photographed standing next to the thing. No bad thing will happen. And it's a perfectly decent interim solution while we figure out whether we want to recycle the stuff or burn it in integral fast reactors or stick it way the hell down in the ground. If we want to stick it way the hell down in the ground, we've already got a site that works very well for us, which is the WIP. Um, the waste isolation uh, something plant. Pilot plant. Thank you. And uh, it's a pretty good deal. They go down a half a mile into a salt formation. And uh, it's pretty interesting down there. This is what it looks like. It's real easy to mine. And that salt gradually heals itself. So what do you, whatever you put in there heals in around it. And here's a slide from Jim Conka, who runs the uh, environmental oversight for the, for the WIP. And uh, basically he says that this is how it works. That salt formation, the Salado formation, they're now estimating that if humanity used nothing but nuclear power and did a once through with its fuel into waste, probably by then it would be using some thorium, and stuck it in the ground, um, you could, Civilization could do that for 10,000 years and there'd still be room down in the Salado Formation to stick it in the ground and stop worrying about it. The Salado Formation has been there for 250 million years. It's not going anywhere. Salt doesn't get into it, doesn't get out of it. It's a really good place to park this stuff. 
and some of you may have seen Rip Anderson when he was here talking about that he was the science officer at Sandia that, that made that go forward. Another thing that, that people worry about is, oh gosh, what about moving this stuff around? Uh, it's so dangerous, it's, um, well, the guys at Sandia had some fun looking at how dangerous Shipping containers they have been loaded onto a being. truck that was crashed first at 60 miles per hour and then at 80 miles per hour into a 700 ton concrete wall. They have been broadsided by a 120 ton locomotive traveling at 80 miles per hour. Another physical test involved dropping containers in a 30 foot free fall onto steel reinforced concrete, comparable to hitting a concrete slab head on at 120 miles an hour. They've been dropped onto a six inch diameter spike and the containers have been burned in a pool of aviation fuel for 90 minutes at temperatures of more than 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. The result in each case, there were no ruptures or significant damage to the used fuel containers themselves. Although dented and charred, the containers remained totally intact to protect the used fuel they would carry. Don't you love her tone of voice? <laughs> so, you know, these things have been traveling around for tens to thousands of miles on, uh, on U.S. highways, and there have been no accidents because uh, this is part of why. These reasons and others are why a good many of my fellow environmentalists already noisily or quietly support nuclear power. James Lovelock, you've heard from. James John Holdren is now Obama's science advisor, uh, has said many positive things about nuclear. He's the reason that uh, Jared Diamond, when he was on this stage, said that uh, he was in favor of nuclear power. Tim Flannery, the biologist in Australia, uh, is supporting it. Uh, Paul Hawkins says he was converted by my book from being anti to pro. So you want to think about whether you want to read the book or not. <laughs> Jesse Ossible at uh, Rockefeller University has come out with a very good article basically looking at footprint analysis and saying nuclear is green and uh, renewables are not green. Patrick Moore was uh, one of the co-founders of Greenpeace. Uh, he left their board, he was their only scientist and their senior leadership, and he left when he thought the organization turned anti-science. He is now a spokesman for the nuclear industry. Um, and he was a PhD in ecology, and he still pushes uh, forestation and geothermal, among other things. Al Gore uh, says very, very quietly, while I am not opposed to nuclear power and expect to see some modest increases in the use of nuclear reactors, I doubt that they will play a significant role in most countries. He's mainly concerned about proliferation. And Bill McKibben is really quiet but he says he expects that nuclear will increase uh, pretty much in line with what the IPCC is suggesting. And there's a, a generation shift that's happened where a lot of younger environmentalists uh, are finding themselves comfortable with nuclear because the Cold War doesn't dominate their world, climate change dominates their world. And nuclear goes from being a problem to a solution with that switch. Uh, just to draw a couple of interesting examples, one was uh, Hugh Montefiore who was on the board of Friends of the Earth in Britain uh, some years ago. He said uh, climate change was too important. He was coming out for nuclear power and he was thrown off the board somewhat noisily. Uh, another interesting one is Stephen Tisdale, who from I think 2001 to 2007 or so was head of Friends of the Earth UK. He said, my change of mind wasn't sudden but gradual over the past four years. And he finishes up, it was kind of like a religious conversion. Being anti-nuclear was an essential part of being an environmentalist for a long time, but now that I'm talking to a number of environmentalists about this, it's actually quite widespread, this view that nuclear power is not ideal, but it's better than climate change. Then we come to James Hansen. When he said a while back, we've got to get from 487, 387 parts per million of carbon dioxide down to 350, that became the rallying cry for a huge movement. And indeed, there is a large 350 uh, event happening on October 24th, worth participating in. But also, January of this year, James Hansen wrote an open letter to Barack Obama saying coal plants are factories of death. The danger is, farther down the letter, that the minority of vehement anti-nuclear, quote, environmentalists could cause development of advanced safe nuclear power to be slowed 
such that utilities are forced to continue coal burning in order to keep the lights on. That is a prescription for disaster. 350.org doesn't quote that very much. So what's going to need to happen is coal has to be made expensive. Climate has to be taken uh, as an issue by the throat. Four major governmental areas, the European Union, the United States, Canada, China, and India. If those four all, all act, we might come out okay. If they don't, or only some do, we're in a world of trouble. Because if climate change gets to the point of disrupting economic or social conditions, the governments could flip into total self-preservation against other states, and then you get the downward spiral of wars, driving worsening climate, driving more desperate wars. That's a positive feedback you really, really don't want. Nukes are actually pretty familiar. Uh, I grew up in Rockford, Illinois. This is just down the highway a little ways. It's one of the reasons that Barack Obama, who was a senator from Illinois, is relatively comfortable with nuclear, is he had a lot to do with these things. In the developing world, that's now actually the cutting edge of uh, a lot of new construction going on. And we can rejoice that so many countries are building nuclear energy plants, and we are doing what we can to help them. And I think of particular interest to these customers, and maybe to us, is a new technology, nuclear technology, most people haven't heard about. Now, this builds on the environmentalist idea of distributed micropower. Uh, that's the way we would reduce losses from long power lines, build in resilience and adaptivity. And usually environmentalists mean solar and wind and cogeneration, but the new microreactors might work even better. Uh, the first one off the line is Russians are building these small floating reactors on barges, 35 megawatts, uh, that they're going to use along, remember the melting ice, the shipping is now going to commence along the complete shortcut north of all of Europe and Asia, along the northern sea route, as well as the Northwest Passage. So they are building these, and they are pouring concrete for the ports along that route, and this will be the energy source. They're also selling them, or will sell them, to coastal developing countries that would like a, a quick 35 or 70 megawatts to power the coastal town. Now the scale is pretty interesting. The large reactor these days is 1.6 billion watts, and a 25 million watt reactor, 25 megawatt, is the 64th of that size. It's about one reactor, one small town. Most of these micro-reactors are meant to be buried and relatively left alone. You don't need to do a lot of guarding of them. This is a design from Toshiba. Here's one that over, they designed across the way at Lawrence Livermore Lab. Uh, here's one that uh, claims it's going commercial right away, based in uh, New Mexico with a design from Los Alamos, uh, uranium hydride technology. The thing on these micro-reactors is they're relatively cheap, they're quick to build, and their designs evolve rapidly. All of them are meltdown-proof and proliferation-proof and various forms of idiot-proof. Uh, there's another company in Oregon called New Scale. Uh, it's designing a light water reactor meant to be built in modular form. You put in one of these, and when you like it, or you grow your town, or whatever, and you add some more. Uh, an old player in the game, Babcock and Wilcox, he has, they've been building Navy reactors for 50 years. They're now getting into this, and they have a 125 megawatt modular reactor they're coming out with. The weirdest one uh, probably is, is a thorium reactor that, designed by Lowell Wood. Freeman Dyson loves it. It's being developed by Nathan Mervold and TerraPower. They're based in Washington. Uh, this thing you stick in the ground. It has all the fuel it needs for a lifetime, which might be 60 years, and you just leave it there. It is thorium, so it uh, doesn't have a lot of the problems that we associate with uranium. Okay, that's enough on nukes. Well, this is kind of nukey. <laughs> uh, yeah. Food apocalypse! This is romantic environmentalism at its worst. It's a visceral fear of what is seen as unnatural, basically vampires. It's only unnatural if you don't know the biology. All microbes swap genes promiscuously, promiscuously all the time. The selection pressure on problematic genes in the wild is fierce. Genetic engineering greatly reduces the huge impact of agriculture on natural systems, and you'll notice that renowned biodiversity biologists like Peter Raven 
and Ed Wilson take no part in the campaigns against the genetically engineered food crops. So then he asked, well, who likes them? Well, the Amish, for one, like them. And in the world, they're extremely popular. Africa especially wants people to catch on. So in South Africa, we don't eat genetically engineered sweet corn in this country. We just eat feed corn, which becomes cornmeal and tortillas and buns and muffins and things like that. But in South Africa, one of the most popular of all foods there is white maize. It is genetically engineered, and uh, they love it. Because it works so well for the farmers, heading off uh, both pests and, and weeds, remember about 40% of the world's crops, mostly in the developing world, is lost every year to weeds and to pests. So for that reason, that because they work so well against those, this is the most rapidly successful agricultural innovation in history. They're good for the environment because, among other things, they enable no-till farming, and that protects the soil. They reduce pesticide use, especially in things like BT cotton, and they increase yield, and that frees up more land to remain wild. Now, this map from 2006 is out of date because it shows uh, no African countries doing stuff. That's because the European environmentalists with Friends of the Earth International and Greenpeace International went to enormous lengths to terrify the leadership of the African nations that this was poison. People starved as a result of that um, directly, and great harm was done. But now the agriculture, the African nations are finally getting up to speed, and uh, after a decade of delay, maybe two decades of delay caused by greens in Europe. There is no good reason for genetically engineered food crops to be controversial. I think my fellow environmentalists have been irrational on this subject and really have done harm. Now, if you've got a question about that, ask the Newfield Council on Bioethics, who took a serious, detailed, exhaustive study of the issue of genetically modified, engineered food crops, especially in regard to the developing world, and basically said it is a moral imperative to make GM food crops readily and commercially available to people in developing countries who want them. Bear in mind, besides the obvious matters of food supply and enhanced nutrition, these GE crops are, can be made drought tolerant, salt tolerant, flood tolerant, as Pamela Ronald over here has done with rice, and they are going to be crucial for adapting to climate change in the developing world. Now, that's just the beginning. Genetic engineering is sort of the sleepy backwater biotech these days. As we saw when Drew Endy came here and speak, spoke, uh, synthetic biology is taking off at a steep angle. Uh, children are having their minds focused on the opportunities of screwing around with genes. And the question that I've been asking for the last few years, where are the green biotech hackers, has been answered by the Jamboree, the iGEM, International Genetically Engineered Machine Jamboree. Uh, they hold in uh, Cambridge every year. They're up to 21 countries, 1,200 participants, 84 teams, and it's, uh, it's, it's growing like Burning Man. It doubles every year. <laughs> I wonder if there's an overlap. One of the things that I, as a preservationist, restorationist, want to see dealt with is uh, that I think that genetically engineered biocontrols could help a lot with is invasive species. So you've got your Guam brown snake, you've got your kudzu, your French broom, your sparkina, your feral lilies, your red imported fire ant, your zebra mussels, northern snakehead, the cane toad that is poisoning Australia, and most graphic of all, the lamprey eel. And the huge question is, how do you fight back once you have an infestation? Well, the thing we've learned with biocontrols is the smaller the organism uh, that you point at trying to control an invasive, the better. You can target it exactly, and it doesn't do uh, the wrong thing. And that you can exp it's already happening with a lot of these. In fact, the, uh, the cane toad, they're developing a ronavirus, a, a viral an engineered virus that um, may well head off the cane toad problem. There's organisms we like. 
earthworm. Uh, the term for what they do now is called ecosystem engineering or niche construction. <laughs> and what the earthworm does is it takes a crappy, from its standpoint, area of soil and basically uh, improves it for itself. But it happens to be uh, improved for a zillion other organisms at the same time, including us. So we like to have earthworms in the soil because the garden grows better than the rest of it. Uh, another ecosystem engineer is the beaver. One of the reasons the Yellowstone Park went to hell is um, because when they got rid of the wolves, the elk increased uh, enormously, got lazy, started eating up all of the trees down around the rivers, the riverine uh, foliage and trees went away. Uh, there was nothing for the beavers to cut down and make dams out of, so the beavers went away. Then they brought the wolves back, the elk got scared, uh, and ran for their lives, the way they're supposed to do if you're an elk. And then uh, the trees grew up, the beavers came back to cut down the trees and make dams, and this huge enrichment that goes on with beaver ponds is back in the Yellowstone Park, thanks to the wolves. Uh, here's another famous ecosystem engineer, Aldo Leopold. Um, he inspired a lot of us, in part by uh, doing kind of wild and crazy restoration on 150 acres in, uh, in Wisconsin. Brought the trees back, actually brought too many back, they had to cut a lot of them down. He undid serious damage, it's a really frapped out farm that he took over, got it for cheap. Brought it back, made it wonderful, it was a whole Aldo Leopold uh, museum and study center there now. He was undoing the damage on 150 acres. We have damage done to a little larger area, maybe the whole planet. And that's going to get hairy. So here's part of why. Geoengineering is, you can already see it, being taken seriously sooner than expected. It's because we're starting to face these harsh realizations. Geoengineering is direct intervention in climate mechanisms. The severely nonlinear mysterious system that I spoke of. That's what makes it hairy. But that's just the beginning of the hairiness. Because then you get to, fine, who's going to control it? How do the international agreements work? It is so cheap to do some of these things. You can change the climate for everybody if you're a very rich person or a country like, say, China, who just says, you know, we're tired of having Western China go dry on us. We're going to put a bunch of something in the atmosphere that'll dim the sunlight a bit. and. Sorry about you guys downwind, but that's what we're doing. Well, you know, we do here, we're downwind to them. We see their coal now as red sunsets. We would say that's action, an act of war. We don't have governance forms that can deal with geoengineering yet, and they need to start emerging. Now, in case uh, you're one who thinks, well, this stuff can't possibly work, um, this is the one that's most popular with climatologists because they know it works. The Mount Pinatubo volcano exploded in 1991, sent, uh, what was it, two, 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide 20 miles up into the stratosphere. That then cooled down the planet by half a degree Celsius. The ice came back in the Arctic, the polar bears came back, and the polar bears of the year of 92 and 93 are known as the Pinatubo cubs. We now realize that it is technically possible for humans to do the same thing year after year as Mount Pinatubo at a cost of maybe 30 billion a year. Not that much. And if Mount Pinatubo had kept doing its thing year after year, it would have taken the global temperature down not half a degree Celsius, but three degrees Celsius. And guys were really dubious about all the stuff looked into it and the modeling makes it look pretty good. So that's one idea. That's the one that's probably going to be experimented with most first. The really green one is uh, the one that uh, John Latham and the engineer Stephen Salter came up with to atomize seawater uh, so that the, the salt water in tiny particles goes up, dries immediately, you get a little grain of salt that becomes nuclei for cloud particles. You can brighten the clouds all over the ocean, brighten the albedo of the earth. Sounds great. And this is a desperately cool sailboat that Salter designed with his flattener sails, as they're called. 
Uh, another one that Jim Lovelock and Chris Rapley from the Science Museum in London came up with is the idea of having 400-foot pipes that can reduce the thermocline problem of the stratification of ocean when it gets too warm and it dies. It's also a way to cool water around coral reefs or to prevent uh, hurricanes from coming through. Another idea is uh, artificial trees. Klaus Lackner came up with the idea of doing air capture of carbon dioxide. And the idea would be to put these things where you can sell the CO2 as an industrial chemical for greenhouses, food processing, dry ice, water treatment, foam fabrication, and so on. Another idea that everybody likes because the Indians came up with first is uh, what they call terra preta or biochar, which is basically pyrolyzed, smoldered, uh, plant waste, agricultural waste, and, and logging waste, and uh, just let it go into the ground. It turns bad soil into good soil. It stays down there for 4,000 years, and it can be done at any scale. The big question is whether it can actually scale up. The scale is, um, is part of what's going on. We are already dealing at scale. The Nobel Prize-winning climatologist uh, Paul Crutzen calls our era, our geological era, the Anthropocene the human-dominated era. We are stuck with its ab obligations. In the whole Earth catalog, the first words we are as gods, mm, might as well get good at it. Those are innocent times. The first words of the new book are we are as gods and have to get good at it. The looming catastrophe of climate change is forcing a change in environmental thinking. The reality of the developing world where most people live is forcing a change in environmental thinking. The shift is from ideology to pragmatism, from a romantic identification with nature to scientific examination of nature with a thoroughness unlike anything we've seen before. We have to understand. Ecology is not yet a predictive science. It needs to be one. Climatology is not yet a predictive science. It needs to be one. We are required by circumstances to be ecosystem engineers at planet scale. We need to figure out how to do it with as light a touch as possible and as much intervention as necessary. Ecological balance is too important for sentiment. It requires science. The health, of the health of natural infrastructure is too compromised for passivity. It requires engineering. What we call natural and what we call human are inseparable. We live one life. Thank you. I'm Kelly with the Long Now Foundation and a friend of Stuart's. Um, That's not going to hold him back. Right? Uh, bring up your questions as usual. Um, legibility counts. Give them to uh, Peter, who will be vetting them. So, Stuart, um, you haven't always been so optimistic. <laughs> what, uh, what flipped that bit? Well, uh, say a little more. What, what are you speaking about? I, I remember in the 70s you wrote something, uh, uh, Apocalypse Juggernaut Hello. Uh, there was something about the... Yeah, we used to have a year's supply of food wrapped around <laughs> my office. <laughs> Young always hope for a disaster because it means a new world that they'll control. This is sort of the survivalist slash libertarian fantasy, and it's great. It one outgrows it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question from Joe H. You can raise your hand if you want. Yeah, there you are, back there. It says, uh, over the years, your message has evolved, but what about the ways of spreading the message? Has your thinking changed on the best way to change people's minds? Yeah. Uh, the whole earth catalog basically showed people things. And the whole earth discipline is a, a work of persuasion. Uh, it's the sort of thing that I do at Global Business Network as a consultant and researcher, which is to uh, you notice I stated opinions kind of strongly tonight. But uh, as Paul Sappho here suggests, a good futurist uh, may speak clearly, but also uh, hold on to the opinions kind of loosely. 
because you want uh, a more persuasive argument or new facts or better facts to be able to change your opinion. And so in a sense, the book is showing how that's happened with me and is trying to show some of the techniques of that happening for anybody. Uh, what we need is a lot more people with a lot more accurate opinions dealing with realities in the world, some of which I spoke about tonight. So to make that connection with the Whole Earth Catalog, which was a catalog of tools for individuals right. who were wanting to change their lives or the world, and you have prescribed this very large-scale Whole Earth discipline, what about for the individuals here? What are the tools for them who go about their everyday lives who may not be involved in deciding policy and, and infrastructure? Do you have tools for your Whole Earth discipline? I think thinking is a tool. Um, this is not a, a book of things you, well, actually, there's a few, actually, there's a few things get in there. I mean, how to bring the birds back, plant natives, because uh, the, the exotic tree bushes don't support the bugs that the birds need to eat. Um, let the coyotes come back, because then they chase the cats indoors, and cats in the US kill 100 million birds a year and uh, kill and eat the deer because uh, 20 deer a square mile, uh, they take down the undergrowth so far that the birds go away along with the chipmunks and the squirrels and everybody else. So that's sort of practical. But by and large, the book is about thinking. And these are examples of thinking. Um, Tarek Rashid asks a question um, that John Baez, who was an earlier speaker mm. maybe a year ago, um, Four years ago, I'll bet. Uh, talked about the beginning of the Anthropocene and um, says that we can actually kind of uh, have a role in deciding what kind of climate we want. So what kind of climate do we want since the climate has changed over time? Do, is there an ideal climate that we're aiming towards? Or in other words, is the assumption that the climate that we ha have had recently the best climate and that we're going to we're at the golden age of climate on Earth and we want to <laughs> maintain that climate? Or is there a better climate that we should be aiming for? I'll bet it's exactly like the idea that you hear about business climate. No <laughs> surprises. And so, uh, you know, whatever it is we're used to, uh, I mean, civilization is not used to thinking about climate change because we haven't had any. For 10,000 years that we've been growing our civilization, it's been referred to is the, by uh, Fagan, is the, the long summer. It's been very nice, relatively steady weather, except for one or two blips, for a long time. That's all we know. So uh, right now, the ideal is that. Uh, there's some indications that you get more life if it's colder. Uh, the ocean really likes it colder, says Jim Lovelock, but we probably wouldn't like it. <laughs> um, Gypsy Achung, says, uh, is there a sufficient supply of nuclear materials to replace um, coal and gas? Yeah, this is one story that went, oh my gosh, we're running out of uranium. Uh, there's plenty of uranium. Right now it's coming from some very n nice, stable, politically friendly places like Canada and Australia. But since the price went up a little bit, uh, when this renaissance started to take place, uh, instantly you had a lot of exploration going on all over the world and uranium finds are, are being made all over the world. Uh, that's just uranium, so they're saying s several centuries worth, that's without reprocessing. You reprocess it, you cycle it more the way the French do. The French are 80% nuclear and um, have the cleanest air in Europe and they shut down their last coal-fired plant four years ago and they're selling four billion dollars worth of nuclear energy to all of their neighbors, including uh, green, Germany, uh, Italy, which shut down its nuclear plants after Chernobyl and England. What I didn't know is that there's two gigawatts of power going through the channel underneath the English <laughs> Channel to nuclear England. A long extension cord? Uh, actually, apparently they're using uh, a very, very high uh, voltage or tension, anyway, an high-tech system that uh, drives it with more efficiency, which you can do if you're underneath the English Channel. So um, there's plenty of uranium. If for some reason uh, we got worried about that, there's three times as much thorium as there is uranium, and it has um, way fewer problems in terms of weapons proliferation and various issues. It's why 
uh, Lowell Wood and, and uh, Nathan Riffold are working on this thorium reactor. And then uh, you've got some reactors, the fast breeders, the integral fast uh, reactors that, in a sense, make their own fuel. And they can take the waste fuel we have now and, and uh, not treat it as waste, but get some of the rest of the 95% of the energy that's still in there. And then beyond that, maybe, maybe, someday, fusion. So uh, this is not a supply-limited mm -hmm. technology. So you've, you kind of very uh, vividly painted why solar doesn't work as a solution, why wind won't, why coal is really bad. What if you're wrong about nuclear, and nuclear is also not so good? Are we completely screwed at that point? Because what's, in other words, uh, Bob Kopak says here, what's your plan B? Here's the hell of it. Uh, you know, we can go as nuclear as we want. It's not enough. <laughs> I mean, that was the point of Saul Griffith's mm -hmm. talk, is all of the things that we can think about to mitigate greenhouse gas releases and bearing in mind that once the CO2 is up there, and it's up there, it stays there for a century plus. Methane goes up and it comes down. That's a good thing to work on because you get a short-term effect. And that's why I think that doing something to affect the amount of sunlight that's hitting the Earth, dimming it or reflecting it or whatever, some form of that is going to happen to buy us time. You don't want to do that perpetually because then you become dependent on it. And you don't want to do it perpetually because it drives the oceans toward uh, greater acidity and it's not so good for the ozone layer either. But uh, I think we're going to be getting in situations where we want to buy time while we figure out all this other stuff. Okay, here's a question from Saul, who you quoted in your talk. Uh-oh. Um, as uh, Saul says, as designers or engineers in this world, we will choose the aesthetic. So how do we negotiate and design the aesthetic we want, the aesthetic of nuclear, I suppose? There was, there's more than one way to, to do it. Is there a process for... Um, That's such a good question. I wonder what's in your mind, Saul. Do you want to stand up and say what you're thinking about with aesthetic? So um, when, if we are engineering the whole planet, we are making choices just how much nuclear, and I'm not sure I'm as strongly in the solar and wind won't. We will do a lot of solar and wind as well, and so that will be part of the choice of the aesthetic. And yeah, that's great, I agree. And we will choose uh, to some respects by default or by choice the aesthetic of how we all live our lives and how much urbanism there is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In a completely managed world, strangely, industrial designers will have their druthers and be deciding for us the aesthetic of the whole world. How, how do we, you know, in the same, how do we reach the negotiation of what it looks like? And maybe what would you have it look like? Well, industrial designers for a long time have always said, well, it should be sort of streamlined and, you know, lean, um, have a kind of a satin finish on the metal. <laughs> I'm with Bruce Sterling. I'm for favela chic. <laughs> you know, that, that scene with the, the market and the train, that's my yeah, aesthetic. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> um, so so uh, we, we got the message of whole earth. It's big. It's the whole earth, whole earth catalog, whole earth discipline. <laughs> What's the, um, we're now talking about long-term thinking, the long now. So, so what's the, the long-term vector in your vision of um, this discipline. How, how is it long term? How does it play out in 10,000 years? Thank you. Busted. Uh, this is a one century story. And at one point in the book I say, seize the century. Because a whole lot of this stuff, these three stories, the urbanism story, the biotechnology story, the climate change story, I think are going to dominate, already are dominating this century, and we are now framing how they will dominate this century, and maybe the aesthetic of how we respond to them and how they play out. But I think they're, they're basically century-sized problems, and um, will resolve in various directions, uh, and be something unrecognizably different by 100 years from now. So I sort of take the singularity out on that one. <laughs> and say, uh, well, biotechnology, you know, it's sort of absorbed, it's digesting nanotechnology and, and uh, going off and making all sorts of things happen at the 100 nanometer scale. Um, 
a major difference is how rapidly these things are moving in the developing world. I tried to give a few hints of that tonight. That nuclear is taking off in the developing world. Biotechnology is taking off in the developing world. Uh, the resourcefulness, not just in the slums, but in these places who are inventing their aesthetic, their world, way more than we are. We're sort of hanging on to the world that we got familiar with. These guys are inventing a world. So the inventiveness there is going to be something that also plays out in the century. And then maybe by the time we're 80% urban and their birth rate has dropped down below replacement and everybody's dealing with what you've been worried about of basically a population crash in the later mm -hmm. half of the century. And uh, we'll have a world mostly run and populated by old people. And we'll look like some something between St. Lauderdale and uh, Fort Lauderdale and uh, Japan. <laughs> uh, that might be relatively stable, and then you know they would need some other dislocation to make the next century as interesting as this one's going to be. So I don't, there's a lot of questions on nuclear, which. Uh, I don't want to get stuck on because your book is actually about a lot of other things besides that. But one, one chapter out of nine. Right. Um, We're in California where, you know, the anti-nuclear thing was partly invented. So um, this is a question from Rich um, Malberg. Mal Mal Malberg. Um, what or who introduced you to nuclear as a solution? What was a light bulb? Because you were not definitely always pro-nuclear. I was mildly anti-nuclear kind of, you know, going along with various friends like Amory Lovins and others who said, well, you know, it doesn't work and all these problems. And the long-term thing, the long-term issue was huge. But then the Long Now Foundation, um, which does not take a position on this or anything else as a foundation, I hasten to say our guiding rule is take no sides. So as a private individual, I was part of the Long Now Foundation uh, board. We went and visited Yucca Mountain not for political reasons, but we just wanted to see what a hole in the mountain looked like because of the hole that we want to build in the eastern Nevada mountain. And we learned a lot about holes in mountains, actually, from going into Yucca Mountain. <laughs> but while we were there, we got sort of scandalized by the tens of billions of dollars that had been spent in this not very interesting hole in this not very interesting place that looked like you know, a semi-reasonable place to put nuclear away. What was the big issue? and realized that the arguments against and then eventually for Yucca Mountain became totally surreal. And the problem was 10,000 years. Well, this was tough for the Long Now board to go and realize the problem was that these people were thinking long term. <laughs> Are we a recipe for disaster? Are we going to unleash one Yucca Mountain after another into the world? And uh, that was kind of a soul, a good thing to do with a board meeting, boy. So we searched our souls, and um, Danny Hillis said, well, you know, they could have built the same hole in the ground for about $100 million and uh, just said, look, we're going to just put the stuff here for 100 years while we think about it. It probably would have been okay. So the, the pathology came with trying to control and plan for 100 years. 10,000, well, now they're saying 100,000. No, it's got to be a million years. You can't plan for a million years. You can't plan for 10,000 years. What you can do is set things in motion so that future people have plenty of options as centuries roll by. And indeed, Canada decided not to do permanent burial of its nuclear waste uh, because that would remove the option for future generations to use that waste for recycling or for some other purpose. You know, carve it up and put it under people's beds because it cures cancer. <laughs> you don't really get to know in advance what you're going to want to do with this stuff. So to throw it down a deep hole in the ground and forget about it is actually irresponsible. That was part of the realization that we came out of um, from our Yucca Mountain trip. I'll just add one other thought I had was you may remember a few years ago, Sappho got interested in this. Sandia had uh, a series of meetings by science fiction writers and various other people to try to figure out what the signage should be over the whip so that nobody would dig down and uh, come across this nuclear waste, sometime hence. And, and well, English would probably be, they got into a whole rosetta, this kind of set of issues. And well, we'll have big 
gnarly, spiky art. <laughs> Or, you know, and then they went, and then they were going to have things buried, like, uh, what's that, Nova Scotia, you know, there's layers, you get down, so you get down to a layer, and it's really scary, you get down to another layer, it's even scarier. <laughs> and you think about, what a god-awful waste of government money and uh, thought. The stuff's down half a mile. It's in the middle of a 3,000-foot thick salt formation in which there is nothing but salt. And there's quite a lot of it, 250 miles in most directions of this 3,000 mile thick salado formation. Why in God's name would anybody go digging down there? They would only do it if you put up some weird sign that said, don't dig here. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, y your book, in some ways, is a conversation with greens, or a wee bit of conversation with with yourself as a, as a greenie, yeah. and um, in I'm some sure ways, one of the interesting things about um, green is, is that it has always been sort of a liberal thing. When a, a Martian from outer space would, would, would suspect that this would be the most conservative politically thing in the world, and um, what I'm wondering is, is when you used to have green that's embracing nuclear power and genetically modified crops, is this sort of a Republican green? <laughs> is, 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 I mean, it is in Europe. It's starting okay. to be in England and places like that. There's a lag here that uh, is difficult to explain. But look, 100 years ago, uh, conservation really was for conservatives. It was Duck Hunters and Teddy Roosevelt. That was who was really, really successfully pushing conservation in this country. And us progressives were for progress, remember? <laughs> And then we got scared of it, and you got worried that you know, the technology was going to do bad things, and then this capitalist engine of progress bothered us because it seemed to be unfair. And so uh, the progressive turned against progress and against capitalism, and then the conservatives who liked capitalism said, well, what, what's with that? And so then uh, environmentalists are becoming this kind of leftish thing, and then the people who are on the right say, well, I'm on the right, so therefore I'm an anti-environmentalist. And then you have bizarre outcomes, like a whole lot of conservatives who cannot take climate change seriously because doing so would mean thinking that Al Gore was right about something. <laughs> and they can't bear the thought. So you've got this weirdness of that the environmental movement has become uh, politically way too specialized, certainly in, in North America and in Europe. What about China? Tell me about China. What, you know, the people who are building all these windmills and solar plants and the nuclear reactors, are they conservative or liberal in Chinese well, terms? That actually sort of leads into my other question, which is you had a throwaway no, no, line. You, you were going to tell me about China. Come on. <laughs> you had a throwaway line about that the rise of the West is over. Yeah. So uh, say more about that what you mean, because I think that has something to do with, with the answer about China, is, is it's, it's yeah. a neither nor, it's, it's, it's a triangulation. I think that's why it's interesting, is because it's not, it doesn't fit into a normal uh, dialectic, you know, it's either Republican or Democrat, left or right, you have China, what is it? They're, they're the other. The other. The other. So, so what do you, when you said that the rise of the West is over, what did you mean? Uh, there's a great book called The Rise of the West by William McNeil. It is a great book. It's the best one-volume history I think we've got. And it's basically a thousand years of Europe figuring out uh, a number of things in North America getting in on the act and uh, guns, germs, and steel. That was our game. And by and by, everybody else caught on to that one and uh, are now in the process of, of surpassing uh, the inventors. Uh, peasant life is increasingly over as people move into the cities. They, these are world cities. They're connected to everybody. And uh, they're economically connected. They're financially connected. Uh, it's funny, when we have a, a financial meltdown in the West, uh, who's doing just fine? Well, the informal economy <laughs> uh, is barely paying any attention. In fact, it's a, it's a safety net, the countries that have this outlaw economy. When people lose their jobs in the formal economy, they have a place to fall. Um, that didn't happen in New Orleans. So 
the action is partly where big cities are. Something I didn't get into is there is a new theory that Jeffrey West and others came up with that cities have this peculiarity that is different from organisms. As organisms get bigger, they get more efficient, but they slow down. So a mouse has a pretty fast heartbeat and only so many in his life, and the elephant has a very slow heartbeat and the same number in his life. Cities have the same advantages. This is part of the economies of, of the aggregation. Uh, as they get bigger, they get more efficient. But they don't slow down. They speed up. And the study these guys did, on, you know, everything from patents to length of electrical cable to uh, turnover in jobs to across the board, how fast people walk, uh, how fast people talk in New York. And uh, the bigger, the faster. And one of the byproducts of that is the rate of innovation is faster, the bigger the city. And therefore, these huge cities create huge problems. It's one of the things they do in the world. But they stay ahead of the problems because of all that innovation that they concentrate. And so cities are this amazing, and this really is Burning Man stuff. Uh, they scale better than any other thing that humans do. And I think they're also the greenest thing that humans do. So if cities are happening, uh, at this faster rate and in this larger scale in the developing world, that tells me that that's where the action is. The rise of the West is over. Okay. So you have a book that's um, in some ways disagreeing with a lot of your friends. Um, Emory Levins of the world were um, a very volatile and sometimes political kind of uh, disagreements. And yet you have this amazing knack to remain friends with people you disagree with, frenemies of some sort or other. How do you do that? How, 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 do you, how do you have, how do you disagree with people that are your friends so well? I'm, I'm interested in that personally because I think it's an incredible trait that you have of, of being able to um, so fundamentally tell someone they're wrong without pissing them off. Uh, Philip Tetlock on this stage gave a great talk about the difference between hedgehogs and foxes. And one of the peculiarities of foxes, the, there's the ones who, who have, uh, are happy with many ideas, whereas a hedgehog has one big idea. An advantage of a fox having many ideas is you don't identify with whatever the idea that you're entertaining this year, or this month, this week is. Whereas a hedgehog kind of swears allegiance uh, to their idea. Come hell or high water, come what may, that's who they are. And there's no room for uh, actual discussion under those circumstances. Foxes are always eager to have their mind changed. And that's not the case with someone in a hedgehog mode. So one of the reasons I've enjoy talking with friends who don't agree with me about stuff is I'm always hoping they'll change my mind. You're only as young as the last time you changed your mind. Who says that? I don't know, but you're Is that in your book? <laughs> <laughs> you're very young. <laughs> Thank you. um, so um, what, what's, uh, it's almost been, you probably turned your book in about a year ago, so what was, <sighs> not, what was not in your book that you wish was? or that you didn't get to? Well, it's one of the reasons I talk about this weird Taiwan event uh, of people exposed to serious amounts of radiation having 3% the cancer rate of the uh, rest of the... Are you ready to Taiwan. move there? Well, I am paying more attention to the hormesis literature. There's a guy, I'm forgetting his name now, who's been looking at this for 20 years. He claims, one of the questions is, what's the optimal amount of radiation? And he says that basically 6,000 uh, millirem a year uh, is good for you. Less than that, you're not getting as much radiation as you should have. More than that, it's going to start hurting you. Well, aren't there there's spas in Eastern Europe? Mm -hmm. Six rem. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, it, when uh, radioactivity was first discovered, Marie Curie and all that stuff, uh, she got sick from it because she did indeed overdose. Uh, but various people were going to spas that are, were hot then and they're hot now. And, um, maybe it's just getting naked in hot water that makes them better, but the hot water is hot in various ways. So, um, a question from Adam. Um, 
Long now says cities plus GMOs plus nuclear. Are we creating a Blade Runner world in which nature will be pushed out? No, the idea is, is to um, give Gaia a chance. Um, I think one of the sort of realizations that come out of this body of research, about three years of it, is that concentrating um, harmful things is a good idea. So concentrating people in cities is a good idea. Once 80% uh, of us are in cities, cities are only 3% of the land area. So we're taking a whole lot of pressure off the natural landscape to keep doing its Gaian duties. Um, I would like to see lumber basically come from plantations, some of them genetically engineered. So we stop cutting wild trees, please. Um, my wife and I were in Tasmania and we saw the eucalyptus regnans that are these 300 foot high hardwood trees that break your heart, they're so beautiful. And while some are being protected, they're basically being cut down and chipped for cardboard. And you know, that makes me crazy. Plantations, you should get straight grain, close grain, beautiful lumber, you know, high as quality you want, just do it. Same thing with uh, mariculture, with aquaculture. Uh, with more intense farming and organic farming, some of it, on uh, smaller areas. All of that frees up more of the countryside. Now, here's a weird thing going on, at least in the U.S. I don't know if it's happening in the world. There's fewer hunters and fishermen going out in the bush. And now some of our, our environmental organizations are in trouble because they get their best funding from people who hike a lot. And we're running out of people who hike a lot. Now, personally, that's fine with me. Uh, if I'm out on a trail and I see another person, the day is ruined. But <laughs> <laughs> it's not apparently good for the landscape to not have some people engaging it in various forms. And one of the things the book goes into a whole lot that I didn't talk about at all tonight is ways of engaging the landscape. And one of the things I push very strongly is, is the people who've been at it the longest in this country, Indians, uh, in Japan, I knew Maoris in New Zealand and across. There are people all over the world who've lived there a long time and know how to live there, who are not being listened to as much as they should. And uh, that's part of my, um, I guess, long-term plan is to be sure they stay intact, be sure their traditions stay intact, be sure their language stays intact, and that they can be part of the this growing wisdom of how to live well on the earth. Do you think that we need a, a governance level of, of whole earth governance level that we don't have right now? Are you kind of part of the secret uh, one world order to, you know, global government? I mean, wh where does all that fit into it? That's the aesthetic black helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> black helicopters. Um, <laughs> we'll have an answer to that. It, when and if we get on the other side of these geoengineering questions. Now, the way I would hope that geoengineering emerges is by lots and lots and lots of meetings that include all of the people who are serious in the business. With a very, there's a dozen ideas out there now. They should be not only meeting and moving their ideas forward, but, but meeting with each other, meeting with uh, getting some government money for a change. It's all been private money. Maybe more private money is called for for a while. We need serious research. We need to get things beyond the scientists who are doing it as a hobby and into the hands of engineers who can start actually trying things, see if they work, intervene hither and yon a little bit in the climate, see what happens. Build the norms through that over enough time and you don't need the Chinese prime minister to tell you what to do. But on the other hand, and this is a point that, that uh, Peter Schwartz is making these days, uh, we imagine that democracy is going to emerge outside the West, and uh, actually what they do outside the West is a lot more like what China does, basically, uh, or Singapore does, a form of autocracy. It's pretty damn benign. And one result of that is that in China, for example, you have a nation run by engineers. You think, well, oh, there's some problems with that. Well, how would you like to have a nation run by lawyers? <laughs> 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 so, um, so I think I've read 
every, all of your books. I read every one of the Whole Earth catalogs, every page of all the catalogs. I read Cybernetic Frontiers. I read your book on the Media Lab. I read your book on uh, the clock and, of course, the book on um, planning, how buildings learn. I think this is your best book. It's really great. It, it does not have in it your research, which is on the web, correct? Yeah, what a setup. SBNotes.com is the online version of this book. And uh, it is the place where I get to put all the charts and graphs and photographs and live links. And the great thing about the web now is, while it's a little bit difficult with books, though thank goodness for, for Google Books, because I can often, if I'm quoting something from a book and it's, it's previewed in Google Books, I can take you to the page with a link where that quote is, you can see the context and go from page to page and then decide whether you want to buy the book. With magazine articles, it's fantastic. You get to see the whole damn article. You can get to see if I am you know, taking something out of context. What is that article linked to? Basically, you can enter the world of my research. Best of all, it's my successful research. So the links that are in there are the things that actually led somewhere rather than the blind alleys that went down. Uh, it's great fun to do. It's a, it's a form of publishing, instead of this uh, seven-month wait <laughs> you know, between finishing the book and you guys having it in your hands, uh, I make a correction in the online version, and it is there um, right now. So it allows me to update things. I say some things about Yucca Mountain in the book that are now out of date, thanks to uh, it being zero-budgeted, which is fine. Uh, but then that let me, when I can put that in there, and then I can add a whole bunch more stuff, as I did here tonight, about the WIP with the kind of diagrams I hit here, plus more information, plus lots of links. So the question in my mind, it's laborious to do this. There's probably a thousand links and all that stuff going to be in this online version of the book. And it's not the whole text. Viking was not happy with the idea of the whole text being there for free. <laughs> So everything that is annotated is there. So it's probably a third or a half of the text kind of chopped up. Um, but the whole connected body of research that comes out of is there. And I hope that all nonfiction books will have online lives like this because that's what I would like to read right. in your book, for example. Exactly, right. There actually were a lot of questions tonight about where, what were your sources, what were the references, and I would direct people to, to those SB Notes. SBNotes.com, right. and you can go see the Taiwanese story on your own, and they had 14 authors, various scientists and medical professionals in Taiwan. They're pretty serious about it. I don't know if they're serious enough to be irradiating their <laughs> citizenry at them. Uh, it's a great book, I highly recommend it, and Stuart will actually be signing books back there right now for those who want it. I got a green pen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.